name's Allison Bloom and this is Emily Heller. And we're from Personal Best Physical Therapy. And we're going to be presenting on how to maintain a healthy lifestyle from the physical activity component. I graduated from Simmons College in 2021 um, during the pandemic. And I started working at Personal Best after that. I specialize in pediatrics, but also fall prevention and kind of maintaining a healthy lifestyle as well. And I'm Emily Heller. I graduated from Simmons in 2011, and I specialize in orthopedics and then also women's health and pelvic health. Yeah. So we're going to talk a little bit today about the benefits of physical activity, types of activity that you can do, the difference between cardio and strength training, the importance of weight bearing and then also non-weight bearing exercise, and the importance of balance training, tips and tricks to prevent falls, and then five just general daily exercises that you could do to help with this. So benefits of physical activity, there's tons of them. I'm not gonna read them all off, but improved quality of life, reduced anxiety, reduced risk of depression, uh, improving all cardiac diseases, preventing mortality, improvement in bone health, physical function, weight loss are kind of some general ones. So types of activity. So the first type is aerobic. So the definition of aerobic activity is an activity where your body's large muscles are moving in a rhythmic manner for a sustained period of time. So if you were to think about sprinting versus jogging, we're more in that jogging. So kind of that low load, longer duration type exercise. So brisk walking, jogging, swimming, riding a bicycle, things like that. It has three general components. So intensity, so how hard you're working, frequency, how often you're doing this, duration, how long you're doing this for. So another type of activity is muscle strengthening. And so that is including exercise that increases your skeletal muscle strength, power, endurance, and mass. So examples of that would be lifting weights, resistance bands, body weight exercise, if you're carrying heavy loads around your house, doing heavy housework, heavy gardening, things like that, you get to count those as exercise too. Okay, uh, so three components to this, intensity, so again, how much force is being used, frequency, how often you're doing it, sets and repetitions, so how many times is the person doing that activity, um, so a lot of times people will see like three sets of five, three sets of ten, that kind of thing. And then types of activity, so bone strengthening. So physical activity that produces an impact or tension force on the bones that helps to prevent or promote, sorry, bone growth and strength, not prevent. <laughs> um, so also this is weight bearing activity or weight loading activity. So walking, running, jump rope, lifting weights, all things like that. So thinking more where your feet are down on the floor versus up in the air. And it can be aerobic and it can be muscle strengthening. So cardio versus strength training. So what's more important for the exercise routine? A little bit of both. So cardio is exercise that challenges your heart and your vascular system. So that's gonna be all of your cardio exercise. So again, the jogging, swimming, walking, dancing, anything like that, okay? Anything that's gonna get that heart rate up. And then strength training, so you're gonna increase muscle strength by making those muscles work against a weight or a force. So that's any of your lifting around your house, weight lifting, resistance bands, body weight training, anything like that. So benefits of cardiovascular exercise is gonna to be to lower all cause and cardiovascular mortality, okay? Mortality, sorry. Reduce the development of chronic diseases, so hypertension, high blood pressure, diabetes, stroke, cancer, and to really promote a healthy cognitive and psychosocial function. So there's immediate benefits and also long-term benefits. So most people will report that immediately they have improvement in their sleep, less anxiety, blood pressure goes down. And then more long-term, so helping with brain health, heart health, cancer prevention, healthy weight, bone strength, balance, and coordination. And then we take that balance and coordination and that will help to prevent falls. Benefits of strength training, so just improving your overall fitness, increased muscle mass, joint flexibility, 
getting stronger bones, so you're less likely to have osteopenia, osteoporosis, preventing those fractures and things like that. Okay, weight control, improvement in mental health, and then also improving your balance. So importance of weight-bearing exercise and non-weight-bearing exercise. So bone health. So weight-bearing exercise is important to increase that bone density. So while non-weight-bearing can be easier on your joints, it's not gonna be as helpful to actually build up that bone density. Strength, so weight-bearing and non-weight-bearing exercises improve your muscle strength. And then impact on joints. So non-weight-bearing exercises are easier on your joints. And so you're gonna have less pain, less irritation, but you don't necessarily get that same uh, bone density help with that. And then, so defining your intensity. So moderate intensity, if you had to rate yourself on a scale of zero to 10, you'd be around a five or a six. Vigorous intensity, a seven or an eight. So a general rule of thumb is using a talk test. So moderate intensity exercise means that you can talk you can't sing, okay, not that. Maybe you do want to sing during the exercise, <laughs> but it's going to be a little bit more difficult to have that conversation. And how much activity do you need? So we recommend moderate intensity activity. You don't need to be running sprints. You don't need to be completely out of breath. Um, and looking for at least 150 minutes a week. So even if that's short bursts, even if you're going out for a 10 minute walk in the morning, 10 minute walk at lunchtime, 10 minute walk at night, you know, you can separate that. It doesn't have to be that you're going to a gym and you're exercising for 60 minutes in a row. And then muscle strengthening. So looking for like two days a week or so. All right. And now we're gonna kind of get into a quick little bit about fall prevention. And so how do you reduce the risk of falling at home? Uh, here are listed some quick tips of how what you can do, you yourself can do at home to kind of reduce that. Um, you can reduce and remove throw rugs. They're pretty, but they aren't always, they're always a trip risk. Um, you can remove cords from the ground or make sure they're not in the central area where you're gonna be walking. Um, removing clutter from the floor and the stairs. Stairs are not a fun place to fall. Make sure your stairs are clear. There's no need to have anything on them. Um, make sure you use in the kitchen. If you have things that you use all the time, like your air fryer or anything like that, a pot or pan that you love, don't put that on the top shelf. Put that on the shelf that you can reach easily so you aren't reaching on your tippy toes and getting like a stool and something like that. Get something that's easy access, nice and easy. Um, you wanna use handrails on the stairs. Don't get fancy here be safe. Make sure your handrails are sturdy too. If they're loose or you feel like they need to be checked up, call that handyman and get that fixed. That's an, a silly way to fall. Um, make sure you're using assistive advice when you need to. Um, no one likes using assistive advice, but they're it's so important and they're so necessary and it's worth it to use it. Um, when I was in school, our teacher who taught us all about this was big into, she was like, for compression socks and assistive devices, she was like, you can get fun patterns. <laughs> they can be cool. <laughs> so get, get one that you like. <laughs> find them. There's all different types of them out there. So find one that you like and use it. Um, in the shower or the bathroom, make sure you have a rubber mat or a shower chair in your shower or bath. Um, there's no need to get fatigued or have a fall in the shower. Um, showers are slippery too, especially if you add some soap in there. So make sure you have some things you can do to help you prevent that. Also grab bars in the bathroom, fabulous. Um, and then finally, wear shoes around the house. Wear a good pair. They don't need to be your sneakers that you wear outside, but have a pair of shoes that you wear in your house. Um, they can be comfy, slipper-esque like sneaker, but at least have something that you're gonna wear that's gonna give you a little bit of support and help you. No walking around in socks, basically. Also watch out for pets. I don't know if you noticed, but there's a cute little dog in the corner right there. Watch out for them. <laughs> um, and then how can you improve your balance outside of just removing things from your home? Um, you can do a, a fall prevention program and research kind of shows that the best fall prevention programs have a combination of balance exercises, which no brainer, but also strengthening too. I feel like this is a component that's often missed with um, balance prevention. You wanna be strong. You can't, just having great balance isn't always enough. You need to also have the strength to support yourself. Um, so make sure you're doing that strengthening, especially two times a week, like Emily touched upon. You also wanna practice. Balance is one of those really cool things that you can always improve on. If you think you have great balance, you can get better at it. 
me, I can get better at it. Everyone can get better at their balance, and it's something that you can continually work on to improve. Um, so keep working on it, keep challenging yourself in a safe way though. You wanna make sure when you're working on balance by yourself that you're doing it with a safety precaution. What you do in a clinic with me and Emily at a physical therapy place is going to be diver different than what you do at your home because you have me and Emily there kind of helping you, guarding you. At home, you wanna take a, little, a, two, a few steps back from what you're doing with others. And then finally, education. Make good choices, use your assistive device, take a seat if you're feeling dizzy, don't rush around. Take a breath, it's okay, no one's in a rush. <laughs> and if you have any questions, ask a professional. We're always here, give us a call. We offer free balance screenings at our clinic. And we also, if you need, we also have, we can do a full evaluation and kind of help you guys with whatever you need. Um, balance in fall prevention is a multi-component act thing. It's not just one thing. Um, having bad balance isn't something that you have to live with, you can improve. So um, I thought this picture was a really good one because it says by 2030, there's gonna be seven fall deaths every hour and not probably 99% of those are probably preventable. So it's a, silly, it's a silly way to get hurt. It's a silly way to have a death. It's not worth it. Get help when you can. Um, and then finally, five exercises for the healthy aging adult. Um, as we get older, our physical ability changes, um, but staying active is an important part of staying healthy. Uh, as we age, strength, balance, and coordination can diminish, but if you keep challenging them and practicing them, they don't have to diminish. Um, loss of these abilities can make it challenging to do everyday activities, and you don't want to get to that point, but if you do get to that point, you can always come back from that point. So, number one, sidestepping. And so I'm going to have everyone stand up, please. <laughs> you knew it was coming. <laughs> <laughs> Emily's gonna demonstrate for me, and we're gonna do side stepping. So you're gonna walk but sideways. Just make sure because there's lots of chair legs everywhere. We're gonna do one step one way, yes. one step the other we way. Want to go into a chair and fall. All right, one step, nice and easy. Yep, and then we're gonna switch directions. So this wakes up the outside of the hips. It kind of helps with balance as well while you're walking. These outside of the hip muscles. Awesome. These out, you can all stand still for a second. These outside of the hip muscles are really important for walking. If they're unstable, then you're going to get a lot of extra movement when you're walking. So you want to make sure they're strong. Sideways walking um, is a great way to work on that. And you want to, if you can, look at your shoulders too, almost like you're balancing glasses of water on your shoulders. You don't want to be doing this. No. That's not going to help you there. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And if you're feeling unstable, you can do this at your kitchen counter. You don't have to go far away. You can do 10 steps or two steps one way or the other. It all works the same. Next, we have shoulder squeezes. So basically, this is a great good posture exercise. So what you're going to do is you're going to take your arms, relax them, and then you're just going to bring those shoulders back a little tiny bit. Yep. So you don't want to bring them back all the way and kind of squeeze to your back all the way you can, but you want to just a little squeeze, relax. Little squeeze, relax. A lot of the time there's a tendency to have a forward posture and rounded head. Um, and so that affects how you breathe. It affects if you don't have to take deep breaths, if you don't have that full ability to expand and extract your lungs, then that's going to affect how well your breathing is. So this is one of those exercises that helps improve your posture, but also improves your breathing as well. If you take a breath when you're all slumped over versus when you're like this, you're going to notice a big difference. Um, dun, dun, dun. You can do it several times a day. You can also hold it. These back postural muscles are really great because they're supposed to last all day long. They're not one of those muscles that, oh, I can lift 50 pounds with my shoulder blades. No. No, no, no. They're there to su support you all day. So you want to be sure those muscles are active and able to kind of have a good endurance rather than just a really good strength. Okay? And we see people come in all the time, and this is what they do. So we don't want your shoulders up by your ears. It's a small squeeze. Everything's going back. The shoulder so blades. Everything we do today, for the most part, is driving, computers, reading. Everything is forward here. So we want to get you out of that posture. All right. Next one. This one we're gonna do standing even though the person is sitting, and it's called drawing in. So this is activating your core. You have two layers to your core. You have that outer layer, your beauty muscles, then you have that inner layer, which is called your transverse abdominis. So what you're gonna do, it again, it's one of those kind of endurance muscles. It's supposed to be supporting you all day long, not just when you're walking down the street, but when you're getting up from a chair, when you're moving around in bed, these core muscles are supposed to be activated. And so one way you can kind of work on activating these is bringing your belly button towards your spine. It's a really 
it's light movement, it's not strenuous. You should be able to take a big deep breath when you're, bring, when you're kind of bringing your belly button into your spine. If you feel like you can't take a big deep breath while you're doing it, you're doing too much. Um, it's very nice, easy, relaxed. Um, and something that it's easiest to practice while you're lying down like this because you're kind of neutralizing your body for the most part. Um, but once you get more advanced with it, you can do it while you're walking, while you're getting up from bed. All these things, you're going to work on those core muscles and that's going to help improve your posture, improve any back pain you might have, and also just keep you in a healthier state. And even though it seems super easy, it's, it's hard, really hard and frustrating. So don't be frustrated if it takes you a while to figure that out. Yeah. Next, we have sit to stands. We're all going to try this one. Make sure you have your chair behind you. So this one, a sit to stand. Oh, fabulous. Everyone's sitting. Good. And now can I get a stand? So at home, we want your chairs up against a wall or somewhere that they will not move. Yes, exactly. But if you are going to do it with a chair that is going to move, you want to make sure you're reaching back for it and you have good support. This one's great because it's simple. And how many times do you get up from a chair a day? Probably a lot. But how many times do you do it purposefully? Mm, probably not a lot. Um, when you do it purposefully, you want to make sure you're going slow and controlled, no plopping on the way down. Um, safety is a really big, important part of this one. You do want, like Emily was saying, you want to make sure that chair, if you need handles, has handles. You want to make sure it's stable, it's not loose, it's not going to move on you. Don't use a chair with rollers, rolling chairs, no bueno. Um, and this is something that it's easy until it's not, essentially. And we have people who come in all the time who are like, oh my god, like this was so easy, but now I'm really struggling to do this. So you got to keep doing it. Muscles are one of the, the biggest component of muscles is use it or lose it. If you don't use it, you're going to lose it. And so you got to keep doing the things, especially the ones that you do every single day, like getting up from a chair, getting up from bed. Those are all essential movements that you need to keep on top of. Um, so if you work on this, do it purposefully. Try challenging yourself, doing it without your arms in a safe way. Um, that's all great ways to kind of work on your strength that are nice and easy. And then finally, we have balancing. Um, this is going to be different for every single person in here. We're not going to practice this today. Um, this is something that you can work on and there's so many different levels. Um, this is a great picture. So some people will be challenged with just their feet together like this. By reducing your base of support, so typically when you stand, you stand with your feet a little bit apart. A little bit apart, yeah. So that's like a normal stance, you'd say. <laughs> the wider your feet are apart, the more stable you are, the closer they are together, the less stable you are. Although this, we also don't want you no, like this. No, that's not the normal stance, normal stances. Um, but feet together is going to be a little challenging for some. Whenever you practice balance, you want to make sure you have a counter in front of you and you're doing it in a safe way. Um, then we have semi-tandem stance, which is when your feet are kind of apart, just like the picture. Um, and then you have full tandem stance when you're kind of like you're walking on a tightrope, but you're not walking, you're just standing there. Um, this one's really tricky, again, Two hands on a countertop, a firm countertop, not a rickety table, not a rickety podium. Um, you want to make sure you have a firm table with you. Um, and you can also try, if you're feeling really daring, and you are, if these are all easy for you, you can try staying on one foot, again, with a countertop, not a chair like the picture. And you'll find even going from full hand down to, if that's super easy, standing here, going to a couple fingers still makes a huge difference. Even one finger makes a huge difference. Yeah, but it's finding what it's works safe. for you and what's your safe moment. Um, general rule of thumb, if you can stand there for a minute and feel stable and like you don't need to catch your balance, maybe too easy for you, okay? But also when you are, if you do feel like you're gonna lose your balance, you wanna make sure you're stepping on the same side of the foot and you're coming down further away from your other foot. You want to increase that base of support. You don't want to kind of do a, a little like lungy thing like this or this. That's a no-no. You don't want to kind of step down right in front or right next to because that's not going to increase your base of support enough to feel stable. Far away, you'll feel nice and stable immediately. And that's it. Just simple as that. Thank you for joining us. Um, does anyone have any questions? If you Fabulous. ever have any questions, feel free to call. Yeah, we brought some stuff over there if you want to grab at the end. Yeah, koozies and pens and flyers on fall prevention, so. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. All right.
name is Amy Daniel, and I am a registered dietitian nutritionist. Um, I have a private practice in Rentham, Massachusetts, and I also am a pediatric oncology and hematology dietitian at Hasbro Children's Hospital, um, and have done that for 17 years. So um, I graduated from the University of Rhode Island a long time ago, but uh, <laughs> not in 2021. <laughs> Um, in 1997, and uh, to be a dietitian, registered dietitian, you need to go through an internship. So I did that afterwards down at the South Coast um, Hospital Group in um, Southeastern Mass. And today I'm talking about just choices for good health and guidelines for nutrition for seniors and um, just some general um, information about your things that we should should be eating. Um, of course, with nutrition, it's always moderation. So that's really the key. You know, we don't have to eat perfectly all the time, but if you can try to eat well a lot of the time, or at least most of the time, then you're, you're doing well. Um, so prevention of chronic disease, eating a healthy diet, and being physically ap active can help prevent chronic disease, help prevent high blood pressure and elevated cholesterol and help prevent cancers and other illnesses. So as far as guidelines, start slowly. You don't need to make a hundred changes at once. We want to, you know, one change at a time and the small steps add up to big changes. Um, promoting healthy changes in your community, work site and senior center. Um, and, you know, by helping each other too. So bringing the healthy snack or whatever it is to a social set setting is always a good way to help. So eating a variety of healthful foods with an emphasis of choosing more fruits and vegetables. So in general, we try to eat five servings of fruits and vegetables a day. Um, I know that can be hard, but I'll go through what one serving is just so you know um, as far as what those guidelines are. Choosing whole grains in preference uh, to refined grains or sugars. So instead of the white bread going with a whole grain bread or whole grain, it's in general oats and um, quinoa and your brown rice over white rice type of thing. Choosing lean sources of protein, chicken, fish, and 90% beef. And then choosing lower sugar foods to help you maintain a healthful weight. So protein needs for ad older adults. Um, this is something that you may think is um, may be surprising to you. Um, so the daily recommended intake for older adults is 0.8 grams per kilogram. Um, however, most recently experts show that really 1.2 to 2 grams per kilo a day is what is needed, which is a good amount of protein. Um, so, for example, if you weigh 150 pounds, we're looking at, which is 68 kilos, we're looking about 82 to 136 grams of protein a day. Um, so the animal sources of protein are our beef, poultry, pork, fish, eggs, milk, yogurt. Um, high, Greek yogurt is higher, higher in protein than regular yogurt. Cheese, whey or casein, protein powders, and game meats. Um, if you're vegan, are vegetarian, you're looking at tofu, seitan, tempeh, beans, lentils, quinoa, nuts, um, soy milk, seeds, sprouted grains, nutritional yeast, and plant-based protein powders, which are often a pea protein. Um, some tips for adding protein into your diet. Prepare strips of meat, chicken, and fish. Have them available in your refrigerator so you can add them to salads, soups, pasta dishes, etc. Add beans, um, sorry, add Greek yogurt to whether it's a smoothie or to on top of your oatmeal or whatever it may be. Adding beans to soups, salads, or pasta and choosing quinoa over rice. Quinoa's got a high protein content. Keeping nuts handy for snacks or to add to oatmeal, salads, fruit, or yogurt. Prepare hard-boiled eggs and use for a quick snack or add to salad or, or meal. Snack on edamame. Try ancient grains such as teff, spelt, or kamut, which are all higher protein grains. 
and aim to have three ounces of protein at both lunch and dinner in general. Another key thing is to watch your sodium intake. So a lot of people, you know, as we age, we tend to have issues such as, you know, heart, high blood pressure, heart failure, kidney or liver disease. Um, and these things, you know, you really have to be careful of salt and sodium intake. So limiting to 1,500 milligrams a day. Um, salt is the main source of sodium, uh, and 15 milligram, 100 milligrams sounds like a lot, but you, it adds up fast. <laughs> adds up fast. So choosing um, fresh foods over canned and processed foods. So instead of, you know, doing uh, bacon or sausage or hot dogs, going for like a piece of chicken or a piece of um, pork or meat, um, which is going to not be as processed. Adding flavors without sodium, including fresh or dried herbs, lemon juice, lime, lime juice, and sodium seasonings, free seasonings, such as Mrs. Dash. Um, there's many, many um, sodium-free seasonings out there that you can use on the market. If you need to buy packaged foods, um, buy lower sodium product, which is less than 140 milligrams per serving. Um, some other good ways to help um, with your health is choosing, again, five or more servings of fruits and vegetables a day. So in order to do that, again, it sounds like a lot, but just half a cup of cooked vegetables is a serving. Um, if it's a leafy vegetable or a fresh vegetable, typically it's about a cup is a serving. If you're looking at a like vegetable juice, you're looking about three quarters of a cup of 100% juice. Um, if it's a piece of fruit, just a medium-sized apple, or a half a cup of um, grapes or, you know, sliced apples or watermelon or something like that. And if it's dried fruit, it's just a quarter or a cup is a serving. We talk a lot about what's called the plate method. So preparing your plate with half of it of vegetables, ideally. Um, if you're not as big on the vegetables, vegetables and fruits. Um, one quarter is your protein, so whether it's your vegetarian protein or your meat-based protein, and then one quarter should be your grains. So that's, in general, you know, the guidelines of what a good, you know, healthy plate would be to get you all the nutrients you need. Um, as far as when we're looking at vitamins and mineral needs for older adults, um, some the big key ones, of course, number one, calcium. So as we age, you know, to prevent injury and um, we want to have strong bones. So calcium intakes for women over 50 is 1,200 milligrams. Um, for men is 1,000 and um, 1,200 milligrams for everyone over 70 in general. And the way that looks would be, you know, if you're talking a glass of milk, that would be about four glasses of milk a day. If you're talking, um, you know, yogurt, we're looking at probably two serving, a, a serving of yogurt is about 300 milligrams. So, um, you know, just it's, it's typically with a diet, unless you're someone that eats dairy, it's, it's a difficult thing to do. So some, quite often people need some kind of supplementation. Um, and calcium works with vitamin D to keep bones strong. Your key sources, again, are milk, milk products, dark green leafy vegetables, and breakfast cereals as well. And speaking of vitamin D, um, it's 600 I use for people 51 to 70 and 800 I use for everyone over 70. And vitamin D up north, I can't tell you how common deficiencies are. It's, it's very, very common to, even if you're out in the sun in the summertime, it's just, we just don't, with the sunscreen and whatnot, we just don't get enough vitamin D. Um, so having that checked, if you're, you know, by your physician, by your primary care physician, and if you're deficient, then repleting yourself with a supplement. Um, and your vitamin D sources are vitamin D fortified milk, milk products, cereals, and fish. Next big one would be B6. So B6 is 1.5 milligrams a day for women, 1.7 milligrams per day for men, and this is needed to form red blood cells. 
Vitamin B6 sources are potatoes, bananas, chicken, and fortified cereals. And you may see this trend of fortified cereals coming up a lot. You know, in general, getting a good whole grain fortified cereal in your diet is not a bad thing, um, just because it provides a lot of nutrients just on a, on a daily basis. Vitamin B12 is 2.4 mil micrograms per day for everyone over 50, and that's B12 helps with your red blood cells and nerve to keep them healthy. Older adults can sometimes develop problems with absorption of B12. Um, this is quite common. Best sources are fish, shellfish, red meats, dairy, poultry, and eggs. If you're vegetarian, fortified cereals, fortified non-dairy milks, and nutritional yeast. Next key thing would be antioxidants. So the body uses certain nutrients in fruits and vegetables to protect against damage of tissues that occurs with the normal metabolism. This process is called oxidation. Also thought to protect against cancer and other diseases. Um, our key antioxidants are vitamin C, E, the carotenoids, and phytomo phytochemicals, which are found in our fruits and vegetables. Again, why the five servings of fruits and vegetables are so important and also selenium. Some other key things is downsizing. So being aware of portion sizes. Um, portions in the US are hugely out, you know, they're just out of proportion in general. So um, in general, we look at, you know, a portion of meat is about three ounces, which is about the size of a deck of cards. Um, you're looking about the size of your fist for most of your grains. And, um, you know, and just, again, in your thumb, if you're looking at like a tablespoon or so. Um, selecting regular versus double portions when you're eating at more of a fast food type of situation. If you're out at a restaurant, looking at sharing an entree um, or cutting it in half and taking half home. Um, and saving half for the next day. And those little steps add to big calorie savings. Um, again, if you just put it in a box right away, all of a sudden you're not as tempted to eat the, you know, the three size portion meal over the, uh, over the normal portion meal. Another big thing was looking at cutting back on overall fat intake. So low fat and fat free don't always mean low calorie. So a lot of times what happens with these products is they add extra sugar in order to cut back on the fat. So just being mindful of, you know, what the label says of as far as um, on the product. <laughs> Try substituting fruits and vegetables and whole grains for hot, higher calorie, higher fat foods such as, you know, your potato chips and your um, snack foods in general. Again, adopting a physical active lifestyle, moderate activity, 30 minutes or more, five days a week. Um, be active at least 30 minutes a day, swimming, gardening, housework, dancing, and maintaining a healthy weight um, throughout life, bal balancing caloric intake with physical activity, and trying to you know, be mindful of losing weight if currently significantly overweight. Um, alcohol, also if you drink alcohol beverages, limit consumption. The recommendation for men is two drinks per day. Women is one drink per day, and that would be one drink would be 12 ounces of beer, five ounces of wine, or 1.5 if it's a hard liquor. And questions? Does anyone have any? Yes. If you have 10 ounces of wine, is that going to kill you? Or? It won't kill you. No, no. So, no, it won't. <laughs> It's not the end of the world. If you're drinking, you know, a bottle of wine, then probably, you know, again, it's not going to kill you, but it's not as healthy for us. So you look at it from a, you know, your body's not, cons you're consuming something that can decrease your immune system and impact your overall um, just organ health in general um, if it's excessive amounts. But... Two, two servings is not going to be the end of the world. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. In some of the things you talked about, the nuts, are, yeah. are there any specific nuts that are better for you? 
um, than some of the others? Um, in gen, I mean, your look, your almonds are quite good for you. I mean, in general, they're all going to pr- give you good, healthy fats. Um, the biggest thing with nuts that we need to be careful of is the portion size. Okay, so a, a normal uh, or typical portion of nuts is about a quarter of a cup, which is about 200 calories, which is not a lot. So um, again, they have a lot of good healthy fats, good sources of protein, but we just need to be mindful of the portions of nuts. Pistachios? Pistachios are fine. Really yeah, really yep. Nice. Pistachios are always... A gift. And going with the, you know, the nut of choice that, that you like to, so that's fine. Is it okay to add like protein um, powders to your diet or like, you know, they're pushing like the, the free protein uh, breaks that you might add to coffee or drink for a senior? Um, again, so your, your protein needs are higher yeah. um, as you age. And if you're someone that struggles to get, you know, a couple of servings of, you know, chicken or fish or meats into your diet, then doing a protein powder is not is never going to hurt you. Um, the interesting thing is people always think, oh, well, 82 grams sounds like so much protein. So if you're looking at that, just three ounces, of, which is the size of a deck of cards, we're looking at this big by this big, that's 21 grams of protein right there. Okay. Most people don't sit down and eat just three ounces of meat. Most people eat typically six, sometimes 10. So now you're looking at 10 grams of protein is 70 grams. So it's, it's not that hard to achieve. If you do struggle to still meet that, then doing a protein powder of your choice is, is fine. You probably don't need to do it more than, you know, once a day though would be, you know, the, uh, the most mark. Cause most of them again are like 25 grams of protein for a scoop. Yeah. Yeah. Talk a little bit about um, the probiotic yogurts. Sure. Okay. So probiotic yogurts. So you're thinking of like Activia, those typical ones. Probiotics are wonderful things. So our helps with gut health. Um, our gut is, you know, a big part of our immune system. So if you're, you're, especially if you're someone that, let's say you recently were on antibiotics or you had a recent GI gastrointestinal illness, um, having a probiotic in your diet will never, ever hurt you. And that's, so the yogurts are a great source or just do, you know, if you're, if you just came over anti- off of antibiotics, then even doing like a, a probiotic supplement is beneficial. If you take a probiotic supplement, is that okay to, if you don't have yogurt, if you don't eat yogurt? Yes, yep, yep. The, I would say the biggest thing, just to be mindful with probiotics, is when you take them. Oh. Don't take them with coffee. Take it at night, <laughs> um, it at night. perfect. Um, some big things that can kill probiotics are um, caffeine, so coffee, and alcohol. So those two things, so just being mindful when you take it, um, try to not take it with those items in general. How does peanut butter compare with nuts? Peanut butter, yes, yep. Yeah. Um, so peanut butters, if that's something you enjoy, then absolutely. Good source of protein. Um, if you're looking to watch your sodium or your sugar, then going with a natural peanut butter is always going to be better. So just one that doesn't have a lot of added um, sugar or salt to it. Yes. And I did bring to um, a couple of um, just, I know the, that cooking can sometimes be difficult when you're just cooking for one or two. Um, so I did bring some recipes as well um, that I'll put on the table. Um, there's a stir fry set, made for, you know, just a couple of people. Um, there's also a salmon dish. And then I just printed off some information, just, you know, general easy recipes for breakfast, oats, adding in berries, yogurt, chia seeds, flax seed, or mixed nuts and added nutrients. I'm um, doing an omelet is always an easy thing for one or two. And that, that could be lunch or dinner too, you know, and um, adding in diced vegetables, diced meats if you want more protein, um, whole grain toast topped with avocado, tomato, 
um, peanut butter or in slice or sliced banana yogurt parfaits so layering in like a Greek yogurt with fruit granola nuts and seeds and smoothies using milk or milk substitute a Greek yogurt fruit spinach and other greens so that a smoothie is always a good way to get extra fruits and vegetables in as well um, and lunches homemade chicken or tuna salad you can add avocado or mayo and you know to um, as the as the fat source um, and adding in diced red onion um, and you can also do that um, over a salad or in a sandwich whatever works and uh, of course a salad is another easy lunch um, thing you can use some leftover protein from last night's dinner on that kind of thing or doing a homemade soup um, just you know starting with your onion garlic and whatnot and sneeze, seasoning with your favorite seasonings and adding in diced chicken or beans um, a whole grain pasta and the best thing about soups if you're doing it you know you, all you want to have is a couple of servings just do it make little batches and put it in the freezer whether it's in a freezer bag or you know a glass container or whatnot so that's always a good thing um, and dinners um, if you grill or bake larger portions of um, meats or chicken, um, try to do that. You know, you can use that in multiple different dishes throughout the week. So just, you know, if you're thinking, okay, I don't want to have to cook every night, but you can make, you know, use it in a stir fry one night. You can use that as your main course one night. You can use it in a salad. Um, you could use it in a soup. So just trying to think outside the box as far as, if you're cooking a little bit larger portion, how you can use it throughout the course of the week. Okay, so I will leave these over on the table as well so that you have um, some recipe ideas as far as that goes. Okay. Any other questions? I have a quick question. If you buy these salads that are packaged in bags, yes. do you think they lose any of the nutrients because they've been Cut and packaged. Mm, it's it's very possible. I mean, I think a lot of our fruits and veggies these days have lost a lot of a lot of the nutrient value. Mm. <laughs> so, it, to be completely honest, just in the processing of them and what they add to in order to keep them fresh for longer. So that's where getting through, if you can have, I mean, if you're a gardener, that's always helpful. So, you know, getting the fresh nutrient, you know, fresh fruits and veggies from a farmer's market in the summertime or a group share or whatnot is always a good way to, to um, help in that ca category. But in general, you're still, you're still going to get nutrients from it. So you're better off still having a salad over not having a salad. If that's a you know but it it is it's the reality of um they're in mass production type of thing so um can you talk about kuname and vitamin k with people that are on um sure yeah so um coumadin and vitamin k so typically if you're on coumadin yes you do need to be careful of the vitamin k you're you're consuming um, and vitamin K is found in your green leafy vegetables and, and whatnot. Um, typically, I mean, the way we educate patients and is that as long as you're consistent with your vitamin K intake, then you're fine. It's is when you... Vegetables uh, that would make the cumin rise or lower? So it's, it's the vitamin K that impacts the, the, your coumadin, um, yeah, the, the amount of coumadin that your body needs. So it's green leafy vegetables, things like spinach, kale, um, your, you know, some of your green, like your broccolis and things like that, but it's primarily your green leafy veggies. So could you have, have some of those vegetables there. you can as long as you're consistent because they're checking your INR regularly in order to know how much cumin in your body needs so if you you all of a sudden went from eating no like spinach salads to eating spinach salads four times a week that could change you know the amount of cumin in that your body 
um, requires. So as long as you're consistent that you don't do it, you know, no, that doesn't mean that you can never have it, but you don't go from eating none to eating a lot of it. Does that apply to other blood thinners too, like Eliquis? I'm not sure, to be quite honest. I'm not sure about the, I know you have yeah, the yeah, Coumadin, yes, that's, that's the big one with, um, I quite honestly, and as far as that goes, I, I work in pediatrics and we don't put patients on it. <laughs> um, in the hospital setting, that is, but I'm not sure about that medication. Um, but yeah, the Coumadin. And, you know, again, it, it used to be a big hot topic when I, I worked in, um, in more of senior care um, early on in my career. And the number of Coumadin educations I did was in a week was multiple. Now, even on the adult side, they don't, they don't do it a lot. It's just, it's, consistency is really the key. So, any other questions? Hey, well, all right. Thank you, Amy, again, for your wonderful presentation. Yeah. Um, you can tell all your friends to watch for it on NCTV, uh, because you'll be able to see everything Sounds good. at home as well. Very good. Thank you. Thank you.